This lecture is part of an introductory undergraduate course on complex analysis and will be about harmonic functions. So we recall from last lecture we were looking at a complex function w, which we can write as u plus iv, of a complex variable z, which we can write as x plus i, y. So u, v and x and y are real and z and w are going to be complex. And we have the following problem. Suppose we're given a function u of x and y. So we're given a function of two real variables. Can we find um, a holomorphic function w so that u is the real part of w? Um, and the answer is, in general, no because there's an obstruction to doing this. You remember if w is holomorphic, which just means has a complex derivative, then it satisfies the Cauchy-Riemann equations, which says uh, the partial derivative of u with respect to x is dv by dy, and du over dy is minus dv over dx. Um, and so what we essentially have to do is, is we're given a function u and we have to find the function v. However, um, we can't always do this because, um, well let's manipulate these equations a bit. Suppose we take the second derivative of u with respect to x. Well this is equal to um, d squared v by dx dy because if we take this first equation and differentiate with respect to x we get this. But this is also equal to minus d squared u over dy squared because there we take the second equation and differentiate it with respect to y. So that equality gives that one and this equality gives this one. And you notice this now gives the following non-trivial condition on u. It says d squared u over dx squared plus d squared u over dy squared must be equal to zero. And this is the most basic of all partial differential equations. It's called the Laplace equation. And um, functions that satisfy this equation are called harmonic functions. Um, so this equation has a physical interpretation um, it gives you the steady state um, heat of some planar region. If you, f if you fix the temperature on the boundaries and let the plate or whatever it is reach a steady state, the steady state will satisfy this equation. It's also sometimes written in terms of the Laplace operator, um, which is just d squared over dx squared plus d squared over dy squared. So this just says that delta of u is equal to zero. Um, well, uh, so uh, we, we can use this to find solutions of Laplace's equation by just taking any um, holomorphic function and taking its real or imaginary part. For example, let's solve the following problem. Let's find all harmonic function polynomials in x and y. Um, so we want to solve delta f equals zero where f is just a polynomial. Well um, we can write down lots of solutions to this just by taking complex polynomials of z which are holomorphic and taking their real and imaginary parts. So if we take 1z, z squared, z cubed and so on and we take the real and imaginary parts and here we get 1, here we get x and y so these are all harmonic here the real part is x squared minus y squared and the imaginary part is 2xy. And here the real part is x cubed minus 3xy squared and the imaginary part is 3x squared y minus y cubed. So these are three, these, these numbers are of course just binomial coefficients. And we can go on like this and so this gives us lots of harmonic polynomials and of course any linear combination of these polynomials is also harmonic. Um, but these form a basis of all harmonic polynomials. 
and I'm just going to leave this as an exercise to show we get all of them. It's not terribly difficult. All you have to do, for example, is to show the space of homogeneous harmonic polynomials of any given degree is just two-dimensional, and that easily shows we've got all of them. Uh, that's except in this dimension, of course. Um, so um, another example. Um, um, we can write down quite complicated looking functions that are harmonic. So suppose we just take a function like z times e to the z. So this is holomorphic. And we can just take its real and imaginary part. So we get x plus i y. And here we get an e to the x times cos of um, y plus i sine of y. And if we take the real part of this, we get um, e to the x times x cosine of y minus y times, um, um, and what am I doing? I'm taking the real part. Uh, x cos of y minus y times sine of y. Um, and we see that this is harmonic. And you can see that checking that this is harmonic by explicitly applying the Laplace operator would be a bit, I mean, it wouldn't be all that difficult, but it'd be a little bit tiresome. And it's far easier just to write down a, a holomorphic function and take its, take its real parts. So um, we've shown that the real part of any holomorphic function must be harmonic. So, so let's ask our question again. Is any harmonic function... u, the real part of some um, holomorphic function, w equals u plus iv. Um, well, it's useful to take u, u to be a function on a connected open set um, I'm going to use a capital U, which you shouldn't confuse with a little u. So here I'm going to take a connected open set contained in the complex numbers because um, we, we quite often want to study harmonic or holomorphic functions that aren't defined on the whole of C. And um, the answer depends on what U is. So we're going to show that for some open sets u, every harmonic function is the real part of a holomorphic function. And for other open sets, um, it's, it's not true. Um, um, first of all, um, we notice that we're trying to solve the Cauchy-Riemann equations, du by dx equals dv by dy, um, du over dy equals minus dv over dx. And you notice that these are going to determine v up to a constant. Because if we know the partial derivative of v with respect to y and with respect to x, then it's uniquely determined up to a constant, because if both of these vanish, then v must be a constant. And um, the fact that v is only t determined up to a constant is going to cause quite a few problems later on. Um, this is quite typical in mathematics. If something isn't quite unique, then the lack of uniqueness will often cause lots of complications. Um, so what we have to do is to, we're trying to find a function v given its partial derivative with respect to y and with respect to x. So let's forget about u for the moment and solve the following problem. Suppose we're given um, f, g, which are functions of two variables x and y. So f and g are just going to be real functions. Can we solve the partial derivative of v with respect to x is equal to f, and the partial derivative of v with respect to y is equal to g? Um, so... Um, the answer is not always. There's a necessary condition that um, the partial derivative of f with respect to y is equal to the partial derivative of g with respect to x. And the reason for this is that um, 
both sides of this are equal to the partial derivative of v with respect to x and y. So, so we have to assume that f and g satisfy this condition, otherwise we can't possibly solve for v. Um, now we're going to show that sometimes we can actually solve for v if we're given f and g satisfying this condition. First, suppose that u is a rectangle. And we're going to assume it's a rectangle containing the origin, just because um, that makes things easy. And v is defined up to a constant, so we may as well put v0, 0, 0 equals 0. That, that, that's just a sort of initial condition or something. And then we can figure out what v is on the x-axis. So, so here v is 0. And well, what is v at this point here? Well, we can get v at this point here just by integrating along the x-axis. So we see that v of x0 is equal to the integral from 0 to x of f of x0 dx, because this is because f is the derivative of v with respect to um, x. So that gives us vx of 0. And now we can um, solve for v of x, y by going up to here, so here, here's the point x, y, by integrating up this line here with respect to y. So we find v of x, y is now equal to v of x, 0, which we know from this step, plus the integral from 0 to y of g, x, y, dy. So this did, so, so v has to be given by this expression here if it satisfies this equation. And it's obvious that dv by dg is, sorry, dv by dy is equal to g because that just follows from this formula here. And we, we, we now have the following problem. Is dv by dx equal to f? So this is true on the x-axis by definition of v, but it's not at all clear that it's true at other points of the complex plane. Well, we, have to, we can check this by a calculation. So dv by dx is equal to d by dx of vx0 plus the integral from 0 to y of dg by dx of xy dy. Here we're just sort of differentiating this expression with respect to x, and we can differentiate under the integral sign assuming that everything is continuous. Um, and this is equal to f of x0 plus the integral from 0 to y of delta f over delta y um, dy. And at this point, we have to go from dg over dx to df by dy, and here we're using this condition here. And now this is just equal to f of x y because we're taking f of x naught and integrating with respect to y. So, so this verifies that um, dv by dx is indeed equal to f. So we have indeed found a function v satisfying these two equations here. Um, so as an application of this, um, we can show that um, suppose given u on a rectangle, and suppose u is harmonic then we can find w equals u plus i times v with w holomorphic. And all we have to do is we need to solve delta v by delta y equals delta u over delta x, and we're going to write delta u over delta x as g, and delta v over delta x is equal to minus delta u over delta y, which is equal to f in the previous thing. And we need to check 
In order to solve this, we saw we need delta g by delta x is equal to delta f over delta y. So this was the condition we had on the previous sheet. And this just follows because u is harmonic. You see that u being harmonic just implies this equation here. So any harmonic function on a rectangle is the real part of a holomorphic function. Well, what about regions that aren't rectangles? So what about other regions u? And there are definitely regions for which this result fails. Um, so let's try u to be the complex numbers minus the, minus the origin. So, so we're just removing a single point from the plane. And we're going to take the function u to be log of r, where r is the absolute value of x plus i, y, of course. And then u is harmonic. Um, so if you've done differential equations, you know this is harmonic because it's more or less the fundamental solution of the Laplace equation. So it's harmonic except at um, x equals y equals zero, where it becomes infinite. And um, it's the real part, so u is the real part of log of z. And we can take v to be the imaginary part of log of z, um, which we remember is just the argument of z. So we seem to have found um, a holomorphic function whose real part is uh, this function log of r. However, the problem is that log of z is not defined on all of the open set u, because the problem is that the argument of z is not defined as a continuous function. So, um, you know, so, 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 so the, the point zero is giving problems, and if we take any region where we can define the argument of a complex number, then we can define v um, um, as, as, as a continuous harmonic function, and we get that u is the real part of a holomorphic function. However, if we've got a region that kind of goes all the way around the origin, then we can't define the argument of z continuously in this region, and we can't find um, a harmonic function v, sorry, a harmonic function v satisfying the Cauchy-Riemann equations. Um, you, you can um, try and construct this function v by brute force. So suppose um, we start at the point number one. Well, we can construct a holomorphic function w in a region like this with no problem. Um, you know, we, 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 we can define w in any rectangle, the same proof we can we can actually find w in any disk. Well, we can then try extending it like this, and there's no problem extending our function w to this region, or to this region, or to this region, or to this region. Um, but when we get to here, we run into a problem. So we're, we're sort of defining w by extending it round like this. But um, then we've got a function that the imaginary part of w is a function v in this region. It's also the function v in this region. And the question is whether the two functions v in this disk or in this disk are the same on, on this overlapping bit. Well, you remember v is only defined in terms of u up to a constant. So we know that the two v's here differ by at most a constant function. However, this constant function may be non-zero. And in fact, this happens for log of, uh, for, 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 for this example here. Here, v is the argument of w, but, but um, the, the argument is going to be approximately zero. But in this region, the argument of, of w is going to be taken to be something close to two pi. So, so the two values of v differ by 
um, exactly 2 pi where these two regions overlap. So this is an example of what I said. You remember I said the fact that V wasn't quite uniquely determined by U was going to cause problems. And this is the sort of problem it causes. It means that if you go all the way around the origin, you don't necessarily get back to the same V that you started with. Um, so, so we see that if a region U has holes, then we cannot always um, extend a harmonic function U to a holomorphic function W. Um, so if we've, if we've got some sort of region which kind of looks like this, so we're taking this region here, it's got a hole in it, and whenever there's a hole, we can just, well, let's assume the hole is the origin, then we could just take the function log of the absolute value of R in this region, and we would again run into the same problem that we can't get a holomorphic function um, and with real part U. On the other hand, if U doesn't have holes, then we can do this, and um, I'll sort of explain why. So if U is simply connected, if the region U is simply connected, then we can extend any harmonic U to a holomorphic function W. Um, and um, Let's just sort of sketch the proof of this. So suppose we've got some sort of region U like this. Here's a subset of the complex plane, and let's suppose it contains the origin, and we're given uh, a function little u, and we want to find a function v. Well, um, we can always find v in some little disk around the origin, because um, you know, we can fit that inside a little rectangle. So if we want to define v at this point here, let's call this point x, y, what we can do is we can form a chain of little disks. We, we, I mean, we pick a path from 0 to u, x, y, and we form a chain of little disks. And we can define v at this point x, y, just by following this chain of disks. Well, the problem is, we might take a different path and a different chain of disks. And the question is, if we choose a different path, are we going to get the same value of v? So does this depend on the path? And um, the answer is not if the paths are homotopic. Um, well, what does this mean? It means two paths are homotopic. So here I've got a path uh, and between two points, and here I've got another path between two points. And they're homotopic if you can sort of gradually deform one path into the other while remaining inside U and fixing the end points. Um, and let's see why... Um, if two paths are homotopic, they give the, 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 the same value of v. So what we have is we've got this region u, and we've got a whole series of paths from 0 to x, y. And we can think of this family of paths as being the image of a map from the square into um, u. So, so for instance, this part of the square is going to go to this red path, and this green part of the square goes to this green path, and um, this orange part of the square is going to go to this orange path, and so on. And you notice this part of the square always goes to the point x, y, and this part of the square always goes to the point 0, um, up there. So what we've got is we've got a map from a square to our region U, and um, what we notice is that on each horizontal line of the square, we can do this trick of taking a lot of little um, open neighbourhoods 
giving us the analytic continuation. And let, 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 let's, let, let, let's call this um, point t. So we're going from t is, we can think of time as going from zero to one as, as, as we sort of move this path along. And for any given time t, we can cover this, this line by a finite number of these open neighborhoods. So we see that v is constant on some neighborhood of t. In other words, if we vary t slightly, we're not going to vary the value of v at this point x, y. On the other hand, this interval from 0 to 1 is connected. And if we've got a locally constant function on a connected set, then it must be constant. So v on the point x, y is constant, it does not depend on t. So this means the value of v on x, y we get from using this path is going to be the same as the value we get from using this path, as long as we can sort of gradually slide one path into the other. So we recall that a region is called simply connected. If given any two paths between pairs of points, you can slide one path into the other. So what we see is that if u is simply connected, then any harmonic view, any harmonic u is the real part of some holomorphic function w equals u plus iv. And this v is unique up to a constant. So for simply connected regions, harmonic functions are almost the same as holomorphic functions, apart from the possibility that you can add constants to um, holomorphic functions. Um, I'll just finish by um, making a quick comment about um, Dirham cohomology. We're not going to use this later, so you can just skip this last bit of the lecture. So when I was solving the equation dv by dx equals f and dv by dy is equal to g, um, in differential geometry, you write this as a slightly different way um, because there's something called a one-form v, which is by definition dv by dx times dx plus dv by dy times dy. So this, this, this is something called a one-form. Um, if you've done multivariable calculus, you know that these are things you integrate along, along paths. So um, the problem is... Um, can we find v so that dv is, is equal to the one form f of dx plus g of dy? And a necessary condition, let's call this omega, is that d omega is equal to zero. Well, what's d omega? Well, d omega is equal to delta f over delta y dx dy minus delta g over delta x df, sorry, uh, dx dy. So the condition that um, d omega is equal to zero is just the condition that df over dy is equal to dg over dx. So the result we proved says that the one form um, omega is equal to d of v for some v is uh, equivalent to saying that d omega is equal to zero on a simply connected region u. So all we were doing is proving this in slightly different language. Um, and this is actually a calculation of a Dirac, something called a Dirac cohomology group. So the Dirac cohomology group of an open region of the complex plane is defined to be the set of closed one forms omega, where closed means that d of omega equals zero, and it's modulo things called the exact one forms omega. So exact means that omega equals dv for some v. So what we really did um, was 
calculate this for a simply connected region U and show that these two spaces are in fact equal, so this first cohomology group vanishes. Um, so we show that being simply connected implies that the first Dirac cohomology group of U vanishes. Um, it turns out this result is also true not just for open regions of the plane, but for open subsets of higher dimensional manifolds. But as I said, we're not going to use um, anything more than the two-dimensional version of this course. OK, um, so next lecture, we're finally going to get on to defining integration for complex numbers.